Number 10, Old King Phoenix Thor. So some people say that this would probably be the most powerful version of Thor. And oh boy, it's probably true. Imagine Thor with his own powers, but also the power of the Phoenix Force. That's when you get Old King Phoenix Thor, who just also looks really, really cool. This Thor is a lot older and wiser, but ends up getting defeated by Wolverine, who was harnessing the power of the Phoenix Force. But then Wolverine ends up getting killed by Doctor Doom, and it is given to Thor. And I mean, the rest is history. Number nine, Rogue Thor. Okay, so this version of Thor comes from Marvel's What If series. Something a lot of fans will become a lot more familiar with because they're making a Disney Plus series about it with MCU characters, which will actually be really cool. So this one tells a story about what if Rogue, the X-Men, had the powers of Thor. In the story, Rogue ends up killing Thor by absorbing his powers and then kind of goes evil. I mean, she goes on a killing spree, killing a lot of people. It's not all bad though. She doesn't stay evil forever. I mean, the spirit of Thor eventually convinces her to use her powers for good, and she does. But come on, she went crazy, and it happened. But just not in the main continuity, of course, because that would just be really, really dark. Number eight, Frost Giant Thor. Okay, so Frost Giant Thor comes from Marvel's What If series, and during it, it presents the idea of what would have happened if Odin got killed by Laffy and raised Thor himself. Loki and Thor still are not really close in this version, but Loki's kind of the good guy. He wants to leave and go to Earth, but Thor doesn't want that and tries to stop him, and he accidentally ends up killing his mother, Frigga. Thor is devastated by what he's done and ends up letting Loki go, and Loki lives a nice life on Earth. I mean, it's pretty dark for Thor, but at least Loki got a happy ending this time. Number seven, Hellbound Thor. Hellbound Thor isn't from Marvel's main Earth. He comes from Earth 5113, or also known as the Dormammu verse, which is named after, yes, Dormammu from Doctor Strange. In this universe, Dormammu is the ruler and has turned Thor, plus a lot of other famous Marvel heroes, into his minions, who will do anything for him. They all have new looks, and this version of Thor is very, very different. He's like really straight up scary. Yeah, he wasn't a big part of this story, so there's not a lot of information about him. But look-wise, he has his classic suit, but with a demon face. But he has all of his normal powers. Number six, Thor Ryan. Sometimes Marvel and DC cross over. It happens. And one time they did, some of their heroes merged together. This was the case with Thor and Orion to form Thor Ryan. He was super powerful. And get this, he is the son of Thanos side. That's Thanos and Darkseid merged together. Like that's so cool. And it's probably the scariest villain combo you could ever have. But this isn't technically canon, it's in its own universe, but it was pretty cool to see. And it's always a treat whenever Marvel and DC decide to work together. Hopefully we see more of it in the future. Number five, Revenger Thor. Yeah, it's called the Revengers because I'm getting revenge and you're getting revenge. Do you want revenge? Okay, so that quote was from Thor Ragnarok, but that version of the Revengers doesn't have any connections to Revenger Thor. But I just wanted to put that quote in there because, yeah, it was fun. Alrighty, so, Revenger Thor comes from an alternate universe, Earth 10011, also known as the Cancerverse. In that universe, Thor is part of a team called the Revengers. And, as you guessed, they are evil. They are basically the evil counterparts of the Avengers, which is kind of cool. They end up getting defeated by Thanos, which is also pretty crazy since they usually end up defeating him. But in this version, or this universe, Thanos is the hero, and he saves the day. For Better Ray Bill. Better Ray Bill, a character that is very popular with fans and long overdue for a live action appearance. If you are not familiar, Better Ray Bill is an alien who was able to pick up Thor's hammer. No one was expecting it to happen, but it happened. He didn't keep it, obviously, but he did end up getting his own cool hammer. The whole thing started when Nick Fury sent Thor up to investigate a spaceship and he ran into Better Ray Bill, and the two of them were like, hey, 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 fight, fight, fight. But during that fight, he picked up Thor's hammer. Now, he was teased in Thor Ragnarok, so maybe that means that the MCU is slowly leading up to it appearance? I mean, only time will tell, guys. Number three, Zombie Thor. Need I say more? No. Number two. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, Zombie Thor comes from the Marvel Zombie series, which was written by Walkie Dead creator Robert Kirkman. It takes place on Earth 2149, and on that Earth, a zombie virus ends up infecting almost all the heroes and villains of the Marvel universe. Thor is one of those heroes, so he looked very cool and terrifying at the same time. But one of the most interesting things about this version is that since he was technically dead, he was no longer worthy of Mjolnir. So, Zombie Thor didn't have it. He ended up getting his own hammer later on, but he didn't have Mjolnir. And that was something that I thought was very, very interesting. Number 
two, Venom Thor. Yep, this one is real, like no joke. Venom Thor. Man, just the name is terrifying because you know Venom Thor is a deadly combo. But like Rogue Thor and all the other ones, this one happens during one of Marvel's What If stories. What if the alien costume had possessed Spider-Man? In this story, Venom takes over Spider-Man, but then continues to take him over and then Hulk. But of course, he doesn't stop there. He's like, huh, maybe I should take over some more heroes. And he decides to take over Thor. Venom takes over Thor and gets all of his powers. I mean, imagine if this happened in the main continuity. Venom would be virtually unstoppable because he retains all of the powers he takes. So he would have the powers of Spider-Man, Hulk, and Thor. Who would be able to stop him? No one. He would just rule the earth forever. Number one, Unworthy Thor. This is one of the coolest versions of Thor, like ever. The reason he is so different is because this is Thor when he is unworthy of Mjolnir. He has short hair, a massive battle axe, ripped clothes, and one arm. His other arm was chopped off by Malekith and replaced with the Black Uru. This look was part of the inspiration for Thor's look in the film Thor Ragnarok, which was freaking amazing. This story really breaks Thor down and shows who he is without the hammer. Honestly, it really works. And stories like this help characters grow. And Thor, or known as Son, learns a lot of valuable lessons during this arc and becomes a better hero for it. I mean, he even fought Thanos during this comic and it was pretty damn epic. Thor is just so cool. Eh, I can't wait to see where Marvel takes him next. Number 10, Infinity. While Infinity is a story that is much bigger than Thor himself, his role in this story was pretty dark. He was forced to destroy a builder, blowing a clean hole through this alien creature. Thor was sent as Earth's emissary to negotiate their surrender and bow down to the will of the builders. But in reality, the Avengers had a trick up their sleeve and double crossed the alien race who threatened the existence of the Earth and many other planets. Thor summoned his hammer. Mjolnir from far away, smashing a hole clean through the builder's chest and proving just how terrifying of a foe he can be when needed. And how when needed, Thor will not hesitate to kill his opponents, like some other heroes might. After smashing a hole through the builder's chest, he finished them off with a hammer to the head. Splat. Number 9. If he be worthy. Dark stories usually come out of times when Thor is no longer worthy, and this is also one of those times. This story kicked off the 2014 run of Thor, where Thor lost his arm in a fight with Malekith. We were also first introduced to the initially mysterious Lady Thor in this issue, who was deemed worthy when it came to wielding Mjolnir and retrieving it from the moon, where it remained when no other Asgardians seemed able to lift it. Thor's loss of his arm would lead to him being very depressed for quite a while, and would in this case add injury to insult, as he was already reeling emotion from being unable to retrieve Mjolnir. Although he would eventually get a sweet black Uru arm crafted because Odin refused to accept an armless son. Kinda rude. And likely added more stress to Thor to hear his dad say that. Sounds like I'm not gonna have a son that's useless. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Just cause he lost an arm he's useless? Rude. Number 8. Sundown. This story is both beautiful and dark. Heart wrenching and bright all at once. It's tragic. And hey, just because the story is dark doesn't mean it can't feature electric and bright colors. Which of course in this issue comes from the amazing Matthew Wilson. Sheesh, I love this guy's colors. They're always so beautiful. In issue 705 of Mighty Thor, we watch a super sick Jane Foster as Lady Thor take on Mangog and pretty much kill herself during the fight. In the end, she is forced to sacrifice Mjolnir in order to defeat Mangog, launching the villain and her hammer into the sun. Due to the fact that Jane was battling cancer at the time, every time she changed into Thor due to that whole process, the progress of her chemo basically gets erased. And when she removes her helmet and changes back this time, she knows it will be her last. Her and Thor share one last kiss as she changes changes back from Thor to a very sickly and cancer ridden Jane Foster and she appears to die. Some truly bleak and beautiful writing here from Jason Aaron. Number 7. Midgard's Final Doom In 2018's Thor, we get a flip back and forth between a younger Thor and an older future Thor, king of Asgard, but also the last Asgardian left. No matter what this version of Thor does as well, it seems there is nothing he can do to prevent the Earth from dying. But that doesn't mean he's not going to stop trying. In issue number 6, his main threat is a future Doom who is also Sorcerer Supreme in this future timeline. King Thor is joined by his old pal, Phoenix Force Wolverine, who ends up sacrificing his life, imbuing Mjolnir with the Phoenix Force in order to help King Thor defeat Doom and save the world. Well, try to save the world. As beautiful as the art is, the story itself is pretty grim. 
grim but spectacular. Number 6, Thor vs Thunder. Near the end of this story, Thor gives into warrior madness and we see just how destructive Thor can be when his rage is left unchecked. He wreaks havoc on Manhattan, nearly killing Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four as well as Jane Foster, while working in tandem alongside his brother Loki. In the end, he regains his senses, but for a while there, it was looking like Thor would have destroyed it all, burned it all and blown it all down with his mighty power. You do not want to mess with an angry Thor, I'll tell you that much. Number 5, Thor vs the Mysterious Radioactive Man. This was a story about Thor that actually appeared in the original Journey into Mystery series. Yeah, not all dark stories need to come from present day comics by the way. In fact, without likely realizing it at the time, some of the darkest moments in comics history have actually come to us from incredulously outdated moments way back in the past. Journey into Mystery gives us one such story and moment. In this comic, we see Thor attempt to take on villain Radioactive Man. In this issue, we find out Radioactive Man's backstory as a nuclear physicist from China who gained radioactive powers. He was then sent on a mission to New York to challenge and defeat Thor. The ending of the story is what is the dark part though. When Thor attempted to send Radioactive Man back to China in a tornado, which Radioactive Man explained would cause him to reach critical mass before he touched down, Thor showed no regard for the innocent lives that could be affected and destroyed by basically the nuclear bomb that Radioactive Man would become on impact. As far as he was concerned, that was Radioactive Man and China's problem, not his. Wow. And he says that in the comic too. Yikes. Number 4, Ragnarok. Or at least one of. This Ragnarok story took place in 1998's Thor, starting in issue 80. It was part of the Avengers Disassembled event. Here we basically saw Thor take on a resurrected Surtur, who was brought back by Loki. Loki, 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 what did you do? Surtur and his army took on the gods, defeating them one by one. Thor learned, however, that this was all part of a cycle and that the gods were destined to fail and be reborn, giving energy to those who sit above in shadow. In other words, the gods of the gods. The story ends with Thor disrupting this resurrection cycle by basically destroying a tapestry, but at the supposed cost of his life and the lives of his people. At the end of the series, he is believed dead by his fellow comrades and heroes, though in reality, he wasn't quite dead yet, but instead was revealed to be in a slumber-like stasis, resting before returning. Number 3, The Devourer King. This is the first arc in Donny Cates' Thor run, which just started earlier this year in January of 2020. The series started off with completely giving him a new dark look and dark and immensely powerful villain to go along with this look who we'd see fully revealed at the end of issue number 4, The Black Winter, also known as the Star Plague. The Black Winter is the cosmic force that was known for wiping out the entire universe prior to the one that we have now, way back when, when Galen became Galactus. In fact, Thor is even forced to team up with Galactus in order to take on the Black Winter, and the frightening thing is by comparison, both of these characters appear small, standing next to the celestial shadow of a monster that is the Black Winter. And also, Thor is pretty OP at this point, so that's that's something. Number 2, The God Butcher. The whole universe wasn't threatened by this villain in Jason Aaron's run, but all of the gods certainly were, and I mean all of the gods. In the story arc known as The God Butcher, we were introduced to Gore, a fearsome and well-written villain. Gore learns of the gods and basically blames them for everyone's suffering, and so sets out on a mission to kill them armed with the Necrosword, also known as the All Black, which we later discover via Donny Cates also happened to be the first symbiote. It's all connected. Ooh. Which I love. Gore at one point also threatened all of the gods' existence with his own god bomb as well, which would kill all gods across all timelines and realities. A pretty scary reality for someone like Thor. Number one, the mighty Thor, Lord of Asgard. Or I guess you could just call it Lord of Asgard. I think we all know what we're talking about when we say that. This story quickly becomes quite dark. Thor ends up taking over for Odin as king of Asgard after his father is killed in a battle by Surtur. In this story, we saw Thor not only command Asgard, but also decide to conquer and rule over Midgard, aka. Earth. Those who oppose his rule are severely punished, locked away, or killed, and Thor basically becomes a tyrant. He also marries Enchantress and has a son with her. Eventually, he realizes how awful his actions have been and how wrong he was when his son Magni, who has fallen in love with a human woman, confronts him. In the end, Thor decides the best course of action is to change the timeline so that none of this ever happened, erasing this bleak story and therefore causing it to be considered an alternate timeline in retrospect. Number 10. Why is he unworthy? What better way to start off this list with actually talking about why the heck there is an unworthy Thor in the first place? As some of you know, Gore the God Butcher was a rather significant enemy for Thor. He killed many other gods and threatened to end them all, and he was fueled by his belief that gods were full of hubris and pride and that the universe would be way better off without them. 
Even after Gord's defeat, this idea would haunt Thor, and it ultimately came back to strike him again in a fight with Nick Fury on the moon. Nick Fury, along with a few other characters, including Thor, had all learned secrets from the eye of Watu the Watcher, with Nick Fury learning of Thor's own self-doubt after his fight with Gore. So in the climax of Original Sin, all Nick Fury had to do was whisper in Thor's ear that Gore was right. These three words were enough to riddle Thor with enough self-doubt to drop his hammer and become unworthy. Number 9. Jane Foster After Thor became unworthy, his mighty hammer Mjolnir ended up in the hands of Jane Foster, who was dying of cancer. Picking up the fallen hammer, Jane became the new mysterious wielder of the power of Thor, and became one of the coolest iterations of the character in my opinion. The original Thor initially came into conflict against Jane, but eventually accepted that the hammer was no longer his to wield. He believed himself unworthy of his own name, which to him was more of a title. He passed the title of Thor off to Jane Foster, not exactly knowing who she was, and decided to go only by his surname. Number 8. Odin's son. After giving up the name or mantle of Thor, this unworthy Thor decided to now only go by the name Odin's son. And you know what? There is still a hell of a lot of power behind that name. Even without Mjolnir, Odin's son is still half Elder God and half Asgardian, and an extremely strong Asgardian too, considering he is the god of strength. He also still has more stamina than almost all other Asgardians. He is still incredibly durable, still incredibly fast, still immortal, still a master warrior, and he is still able to wield the lightning. Beyond that, he has the help of his allies who he has gained over the thousands of years he's been alive. He also has an incredibly cool looking black Uru arm after Malekith cut off his normal arm. Oh, and he wields a weapon he is still all too familiar with. Number 7. Yarnbjorn. Yarnbjorn was the dwarven forged battle axe composed of Asgardian steel and created for Rana, one of the original members of the Valkyrie. After she mysteriously disappeared, having been assimilated by the headless celestial, Yarnbjorn was stored in Asgard's armory and eventually taken up by the younger Thor a long time before he was ever able to wield the mighty Mjolnir. Eventually, after a lot of stuff involving celestials, King the Conqueror, and the Apocalypse Twins, Yarnbjorn was replaced in the Asgardian armory. When Thor could no longer wield Mjolnir, Mjolnir after his battle with Nick Fury on the moon, Thor took up Yarnbjorn once again. While fighting Malekith and a force of frost giants under the sea, Malekith took Yarnbjorn from Thor and used it to cut off his left arm. Odin's son is a weapons master, familiar with every Asgardian weapon, but when he becomes unworthy, it makes sense that he would go back to wielding this awesome axe that was his faithful weapon in his youth. Number 6. Toothnasher when Thor became unworthy to wield Mjolnir, he also lost the powers it bestowed on him, including flight. As such, he needs a bit of help from time to time. While he has many friends and allies across the universe, everyone knows that a boy's strongest connection is with his giant Asgardian pet goat. Toothnasher is one of a pair of goats that are pets to Thor and who, in the mythology, would help pull Thor's chariot. In the unworthy Thor story, his one goat, Toothnasher, is Odin's son's companion, mainly used to help Thor travel through space and fly to where he needs to go. But he is also perfectly capable of helping Thor in battle. He is an Asgardian goat, and as such is super goat strong. He's even capable of damaging Mjolnir. Obviously, Toothnasher is capable of traveling between the Ten Realms and both running and flying at super high speeds. And we, we love this awesome space goat, yes we do. Number 5. His Quest In the Unworthy Thor story that was Odin's son's main solo Marvel run, we learn that the Hammer of Ultimate Thor had survived the incursions and traveled through universes to eventually land in the 616 Reality's Asgard Realm, which is currently in ruins. Odin's son learns that the whole ruined realm of Asgard has been taken by an elder of the universe, the Collector, who is trying to wield the hammer for himself, but he is unworthy, obviously. Odin's son travels to the Collector's ship and battles furiously against the Collector and some of Thanos' Black Order, mainly Proxima Midnight and Black Swan, and a mysterious third character. While Odin's son is worthy of this ultimate hammer, this is not his hammer. And after using lightning to defeat the villainous forces, he decides to bring Asgard back where it belongs and leaves the ultimate Thor's hammer here, where a certain somebody wields it to become War Thor. Number 4. Beta Ray Bill Almost as if the unworthy Thor story is a greatest hits, a lot of the best and favorite Thor characters show up here. 
One that everybody loves to see is the last existing Corbinite and wielder of Stormbreaker, Odin's son's worthy brother, Beta Ray Bill. Beta Ray Bill first showed up way back in Thor number 333 in August of 1983, and he was the first character to ever be worthy of wielding the hammer of Mjolnir, as far as I'm aware. Bill meets up with Odin's son when he discovers that Asgard is no longer where it should be and has been taken by the Collector. And he fights alongside Odin's son to both help return Asgard and to help Thor wield his new hammer. Beta Ray Bill is an amazing character. He is crazy powerful and while not native to Asgard, he is loyal to both Odin and Thor, even offering up Stormbreaker to Odin's son when he realized he had become unworthy. A better friend you'll be hard pressed to find. Number 3 Mangog Sometime after the events of Unworthy Thor and after Jane Foster Thor had been challenged by the Shi'ar gods, the Mangog, one of the most powerful entities in all of Marvel Comics, was released and resurfaced, attacking War Thor when he reclaimed the Ultimate Universe Mjolnir. When Asgardia's Watcher, Heimdall, lowered his head for a moment, Mangog attacked with blinding speed and fury. All the defenders of Asgardia tried their best to defend their home. Odin's son stood by his father's side, but they failed to stop this creature. Odin's son assisted Jane Foster Thor in fighting the monster while his people evacuated Asgardia. In order to put an end to the Mangog, Jane fastened it to Mjolnir with an unbreakable chain and hurled them into the sun. Since his action resulted in Mjolnir's destruction, Jane returned to her human form and passed away due to her cancer. Number two, Thor again? Unwilling to let Jane go after she passed, Odin's son attempted to channel the God Tempest to use its power to revive her. Odin joined him too, since he had seen the hesitation within Jane's own soul at the gates of the afterlife, and they were successful in bringing her back. With the destruction of Mjolnir and her inability to continue as Thor, Jane convinced Odin's son to rise up again and reclaim his name and identity. Odin's son finally became Thor again, but alas, he still did not have his mighty hammer. Not that he needs it to be the amazing character we all know he is, but still. Number one, worthy again. In order to find a way to overcome the returned Malekith, Thor nailed himself to Yggdrasil, the world tree, which had taken root in the sun, because that makes sense. After sacrificing his left eye and the last shards of Mjolnir in his possession, Thor figured to recruit his older and younger selves, the ones that he had defeated Gore the God Butcher with. The three of them were joined by Jane Foster, who had temporarily returned to her Thor form by the rebuilt hammer of the War Thor. During battle against Malekith, who had empowered himself with the Venom symbiote, the god Tempest manifested in the sun and Thor commanded it from Earth to reforge Mjolnir in an extremely awesome moment. The hammer came down and landed right in front of Thor Odin's son, and he, having realized that his struggle to become worthy in itself was what made him worthy, picked up his hammer. Thor used Mjolnir to deliver the final blow that defeated Malekith. After this awesome heroic act, Odin stepped down as Asgardia's Allfather and appointed Thor as the new Allfather of Asgardia. Awesome. Number 10, Superior Spider-Man. Superior Spider-Man is an alternate version of Spider-Man who actually hails from the reality of Earth 616 as well. Superior Spider-Man was the name given to Otto Octavius's version of Spider-Man, which came about after a plot to steal Spider-Man's body was successful. Otto's body was failing and so he decided to live on by swapping bodies with Peter Parker, which meant that Peter's consciousness ended up dying in Otto's failing body, while Otto's consciousness got to live on inside Peter's young and healthy bod. However, Peter managed to convince Otto to be a hero before he passed away, and so Otto set out to do so, aiming to be a better hero even than Peter had been. Of course, Octavius in the end wasn't really cut out for heroics, although he did do his best. He struggled at times with making the right choices, and was also prone to doling out more severe forms of punishment for villains, and using more sinister methods when it came to keeping the streets safe. In the end, he chose to relinquish the title and body back to Peter, who still managed to live on via his subconscious, which still remained attached to his original body. And friends, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it, be sure to let us know by smashing that like button. 
I mean, there's definitely a lot of evil Spider-Man out there, so I'm pretty sure we could keep going with this one. Number nine, Symbiote Spider-Man. Well, technically still 616 Peter Parker, Symbiote Spider-Man could be considered an alternate in the sense that it was a very specific version of Peter or a very specific time in his life where he took to using more brutal and violent tactics to deal with criminals. This was, of course, brought upon by the alien symbiote who had bonded to Peter and who he had mistaken for just being a new suit initially. Eventually, Spider-Man in his black suit realized that the suit itself was alive and had kind of taken him over. He fought hard, sought out help, and would eventually become separated from the suit, who otherwise did not wish to leave him. In so doing, Spider-Man would unwillingly create an even worse villain in Venom. At least, initially. Venom might be a hero now, but of course he did not start out that way, instead being a determined and relentless enemy to Spider-Man in his early years in the comics, who also sometimes was prone to cannibalistic tendencies and threats. Number 8. The CEO In an alternate 2099 reality, we see explored in the video game Spider-Man Edge of Time, Peter Man actually ends up being the big villain. In this reality, Peter goes on to become the CEO of Alchemax. His goal was noble, but uh, kind of selfish and also kind of messed up. He hoped to use time gateway technology to channel quantum energy and bring back the lives of all of those that he'd lost. In this reality, Peter Parker was still Spider-Man, but either faked his death or just let everyone believe he had died so he could work behind the scenes as Alchemax's CEO, getting everything in place so that he could eventually put his own plan into motion. This version of Peter ends up getting erased from time after Miguel O'Hara's Spider-Man beats him up and manages to basically reset young Peter's story, thereby convincing Peter to never become the CEO of Alchemax and preventing this evil future self from ever existing. Number 7. Asset 42 Asset 42 was likely one of the first clones ever made by the assessor of Miles Morales. This clone was considered to be a burner clone and only lasted a few issues. But what a roller coaster of a ride those few issues he appeared in were. This evil version of Miles Morales first appeared in issue 17 of the Miles Morales Spider-Man series, and shortly thereafter perished in a fight against Miles. Miles seemingly kills Asset 42 in this fight, but in reality, the clone was revealed to have only really been made to last for uh, about a day. So it's highly likely that even without fighting Miles, he would have just died, as he was already breaking down and basically turning into liquid-like goo, as is evident in his final fight against the original one and only Miles Morales. Asset 42 was in league with Ultimatum and helped to kidnap the real Miles for that villain. Number 6. Ultimatum Ultimatum is an evil alternate version of hero and Spider-Man Miles Morales. Or really, he's the main counterpart to Miles, who hails from Earth 1610, the Ultimate Universe. Ultimatum is the version of Miles that existed on Earth 616, his 616 counterpart. 616 Miles was a criminal who allied himself with the Kingpin, growing up and belonging to a crime family. He proved his loyalty to Wilson Fisk and was permitted by the Kingpin to later on retire because he was so loyal. However, after his wife died, he decided to do what Kingpin himself had ultimately decided against when it came to his dead wife, Vanessa, to find an alternate version of her in the multiverse who was alive so that he could reunite with her. Miles ended up in the reality of Earth 1610 as a result. Eventually, he would return to Earth 616, only to find that Miles of 1610 had emigrated there. Ultimatum at this point decided to set things right and planned to send Miles and his family back to 1610, taking back his rightful place as the Miles Morales of 616, and aiming to become a prominent criminal and villain in New York thereafter. Number 5. Slim. Recently, Miles Morales got his own clone saga in his series Miles Morales Spider-Man. It turned out that the assessor had made clones of Miles after capturing and studying him. This batch of clones was unstable and after escaping, were on the hunt to find a cure using any means necessary. Salim was sort of like the leader among them and he ended up at odds with Spider-Man Miles and Spider-Man Peter. Due to being raised while rapidly aging by the assessor, Salim and his brothers were kind of messed up and kind of misguided and kind of evil. They inherently struck out at Miles and Peter when the two groups of Spider-Men crossed one another's paths. After Miles mistook their found cure for a serum to make more clones and ended up destroying it, Salim decided to kidnap Miles' baby sister, Billy, in order to lure Miles to him. With only a few hours left to live, Salim wanted to face Miles, hoping to prove that he had successfully been created to be the superior version of him, despite being otherwise unstable and effective. As so many clones have been, 
and often are. Number 4, Craven the Hunter. It's not just Doc Ock who's taking a swing at web slinging when it comes to Spider-Man's rogues gallery. Craven also once decided to step into Peter's shoes and become Spider-Man for a short time. This was during Craven's last hunt, when Craven seemingly had killed Peter and then took his place to prove that he was the better between the two. Craven's approach to heroics was even more brutal in my opinion than Otto's, with many villains ending up fatally injured after Craven attempted to get rid of them. In the end, it was revealed that Spider-Man wasn't actually dead, but had simply been given a drug to put him in a hibernation-like state after Craven had disposed of him. Eventually, he was able to rise from the grave and return only to find out that Craven had been making a mess of the Spider-Man mantle by adopting it in his absence. Craven would end up basically surrendering content with his last hunt, believing that he'd accomplished everything he had set out to do in his life. This story and Craven's time as Spider-Man ends with him taking his own life. But don't worry, this is comics, so of course Craven would be back. Number three, pestilence. Pestilence hails from an alternate AOA, Age of Apocalypse reality, the reality of Earth 5701. Here, Spider-Man ends up being chosen to become one of Apocalypse's four horsemen of death. He takes on the role of pestilence and this much more evil version of the character, allied with mutant super villain Apocalypse also really looks the part too. He has fangs which are poisonous and six arms, really looking more like a Spider-Man than most of his heroic counterparts typically do. Here Peter was actually chosen to become one of Apocalypse's four horsemen because he was considered so inherently good at heroics and a, as a person I imagine. Apocalypse chose heroes he identified as the best among them to become his horsemen in this reality. Number 2, Spider Doppelganger. The Doppelganger or more specifically the Spider Doppelganger or the Spider-Man doppelganger if you want, was originally an enemy created by the Magus during the Infinity War event. He was one of the many evil doppelgangers created to fight against the superhero community which opposed Magus in the conflict. Although like many of the other doppelgangers, the Spider-Man doppelganger would die during Infinity War. He wouldn't stay dead though as so many of the other doppels had. Instead, Spider doppelganger ended up being resurrected by Demogoblin and would end up joining with him for a time, acting as his sidekick and being treated kinda like his pet. Spider Doppelganger would also go on to team up with such villainous spider enemies as Carnage and Shriek. In fact, he'd actually become for a time very close and loyal to Shriek, who treated him as though he were her own son. Number 1, Norman Osborn. On the reality of Earth 44145 lives a version of Norman Osborn who becomes imbued with spider-like powers and abilities. Of course, this being Norman, he decides to use said power in his pursuit of more power, not inherently being the hero type. Peter Parker, who used to work for Norman, reveals his plan to Norman's son and Peter's friend Harry in a letter. This leads to Peter's death which in turn motivates Harry to fight his father. Norman Osborn as Spider-Man would go on to team up with Superior Spider-Man and Spider's Man briefly during the Spider-Geddon event, but would end up partnered solely with Spider's Man after suggesting that to defeat the Inheritors they simply trap them on our 616. Obviously as that was Superior Spider-Man's homeworld, he was not really down for this plan. Number 10, Man Spider. Man Spider is a version of Peter who ended up mutating and having multiple arms from the main continuity. It was a pretty freaky time in Peter's life and happened after Spider-Man tried to create a cure to get rid of his abilities and return him to his normal old depowered self. Unfortunately for Peter, this definitely did not work as planned and instead just left him with four arms instead of two. Basically the opposite of the desired effect, leaving him more freaky than normal, which was kind of what he was going for. There is a version of the four-armed Spider-Man who actually ended up keeping the arms instead of getting rid of them, and he hails from the reality of Earth 1298 and is known as Man Spider, obviously. I'm guessing that having a secret identity would be pretty tricky for someone like Man Spider. Number 9, Savage Spider Man. Savage Spider Man had an upbringing among monsters, and for that reason can be considered uh, kind of monstrous. His appearance isn't super monstrous, although he does share his editorial name with a series that seems to feature a pretty frightening looking mainstream Savage Spider Man, which we may or may not talk about later. Savage Spider-Man of Earth 83043 ended up getting his powers from growing up in the Savage Lands. His story is that he was lost there after the plane he was on with his parents crashed. His parents died in the crash, but young Peter survived and was taken in by the giant spiders of Savage Land, whose toxic bites helped him to build up both an immunity to toxins and also granted him spider-like superpowers. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you haven't already, please head on over to Facebook where you can follow us there as well. It really does help us out here and it helps us out there so yeah just help us out and also thanks for doing that if you've already done that you're like I get it Amanda you say it every time just want to make sure you know 
Number 8. Scarlet Spider Kane was one of the clones of Peter Parker that we got to know in the Clone Saga. He typically goes by the mantle of Scarlet Spider now, which at one point was actually used by another Peter clone, Ben Riley. Initially in the comics, Kane was presented more as a villain, or at least a misunderstood villain. He misunderstood hero. He wasn't really completely a straight up villain, but he did some shady things. He was a clone that was basically defective, and as a result, his degeneration messed with his mind. He also came with the mark of Cain, which was pretty monstrous, which allowed him to seemingly burn the skin of those he touched, typically leaving his mark of Cain on their face. In reality, this was just a variation of Spider-Man's wall crawl power, as when Spider-Man crawls on walls, this is because of little hook hairs basically in his hands and feet, which allow him to stick. See the Sam Raimi movies for that in person. Similar deal for Kane, but he was using this to basically melt people's faces at the time. Number 7. Ghost Spider Not to be confused with the other Ghost Spider, Gwen Stacy vs 65, this Ghost Spider is an alternate version of Peter Parker from Earth 11638. In this reality, Uncle Ben did not die and was there to help mentor Peter Parker as he continued on on his journey as a hero. Peter here became not just a celebrity and an icon as a superhero, but was also a successful business owner and a philanthropist. However, in secret, he and Ben were working together to lure other Spider-Men from other realities to their world so that they could zap them of their power, killing them in the process in order to bolster Earth-11638 Spider-Man, transferring their powers to him and making him stronger. In the end, Spider-Man of Earth-616, who fell into this trap, helped Earth-11638 Peter Parker to see the error of his ways. Having a change of heart, this version of Spider-Man sacrificed himself to save 616 Peter, ending up in a coma as a result. He was returned to life by an alternate Sorcerer Supreme who needed his help, and then came back as the Ghost Spider, who kind of looks like a blue flame ghost rider. Number 6. Mainstream Savage Spider-Man Mainstream Savage Spider-Man comes from his own self-titled series which spins out of non-stop Spider-Man. So if you wanted to read Savage Spider-Man, I'd recommend going back and reading that first. I think it's only like 5 issues, so it's also not too long. This story I believe is part of the mainstream continuity, so technically the Peter Parker that we see here in the, his monstrous form is in fact Earth 616 Peter Parker. In the non-stop Spider-Man series there was even mention of the Beyond Corporation, which also helped me to really cement this, at least in my mind, as part of the main continuity canon. I mean, I saw it was kind of listed as that, but... I was skeptical and then I saw that and I was like, nah, no, it's probably main continuity. I think we can definitely say it's main continuity. So hopefully I am right and not wrong about that. But while this is technically 616, it's also a very specific look and time in Peter's life. Like back when he had those four arms, which we kind of touched on earlier. So I figured I could count it for the purpose of this list. It's also where our thumbnail for this video will likely come from. So I thought it might be cool to explain it if you're like, hey, well, what's that thing? That's Savage Spider-Man. Savage Spider-Man is Earth 616 Peter Parker mutated by the drug known as A+, which typically improves performance at the cost of intelligence for most users. However, for Spider-Man, due to his unique physiology, it also turned him into a kind of like part man, part spider monster hybrid thing. Poor Peter. Number 5. Spider's Man Spider's Man is definitely one of the creepiest ideas for an alternate Spider-Man that we've seen in maybe ever. <laughs> this version of Peter Parker was actually consumed by spiders, but his consciousness was also absorbed by them. So while physically he's gone, mentally he kind of like lives on in them. He's literally a Spider-Man made of spiders. Hence the name Spiders Man. He has a tragic backstory, but don't feel too bad for him. He also would be the one to team up with a Norman Osborn version of Spider-Man, plotting to betray the rest of the spider army that he had been recruited to. And he also, as a bunch of spiders, seems to enjoy uh, kind of eating people, a taste he developed as time went on. Number 4. Patton Parnell Patton Parnell is one of the vilest alternates of Spider-Man around. He shows up during our exploration of the Spider-Verse where we learn that he is a fairly sadistic alternate of Peter Parker whose hobbies include things like burning ants with a magnifying glass on hot sunny days and spying on his neighbor whom he's kinda obsessed with, Sarah Jane. Patton of course is likely twisted in part because it is heavily implied that his uncle mistreats him. He is bitten by a spider but instead of gaining miraculous abilities that all in all make him a more responsible person and a hero, he becomes a spider-like creature mutating and becoming more monstrous and murderous, both inside and out. 
Yikes. Number three, Poison. Poison is an alternate version of Peter Parker inspired by the Spider Man story, The Other. He hails from a what if where we explore the idea of what would have happened had Spider Man rejected his connection to the spider within and rejected instead of embracing his role as a spider totem. This would have left Peter vulnerable basically to outside attack. Trapped within his cocoon with no way out, the symbiotic being that we often refer to as Venom sensed Peter's vulnerability and saw a chance to merge with him. Venom then leaves his current host, Matt Gargan, to forcibly connect with Peter and together they become Poison. Poison is horrifying and attempts to recruit Mary Jane as his partner, but after she rejects him, he believes that the corpse of Gwen Stacy will suit him better. Oh dear. Number 2, Matt Gargan. Matt Gargan is known as the Spider-Man villain Scorpion, but at one point, he too became an alternate version of Spider-Man. Albeit a really messed up and twisted version as he served as Spider-Man for Norman Osborn's Dark Avengers, which was primarily made up of villains posing as heroic counterparts. In Matt's case, the heroic man he was made to fill in for was Spider-Man. Although he wasn't so much Spider-Man, but kind of like an alternate Venom posing as Spider-Man. His suit was made of the symbiotic being known as Venom, who was merged with him at the time. And was also like, really juiced. <laughs> but Norman fixed it so that he wouldn't appear as juiced. He still kind of got like a little giant. <laughs> he got a little giant <laughs> when it came to uh, him attacking people though. This often turned Matt Gargan's Spider-Man into a horrifying monster who threatened to, and often actually did, devour those people who stood in his way. Even sometimes almost eating his own teammate, which obviously they did not like. <laughs> Number 1, I Apex. I Apex is known in Marvel Comics as I Apex the Decapitator, and was once worshipped as a god in Peru. Remember how we talked about Man Spider earlier? I Apex is like a more terrifying version of that being. He is typically known as having pointed teeth, snakes for hair with multiple arms, and his lower half being the hairy body and legs of a spider. He ended up getting recruited to Norman Osborn's Dark Avengers to act as their Spider-Man after Matt Gargan was Spider-Man because this was a different version of Spider-Man, a different version of the Dark Avengers, after Norman Osborn escaped the raft the second time, this time successfully, and then attempted to resurrect Hammer and bring back the Dark Avengers. I Apex was made to look more humanoid, more like Spider-Man with a genetic formula, except for the fact that, you know, he had four arms still, so almost like Spider-Man, like, but not quite. Later on, he would also be coerced into serving on Luke Cage's Dark Avengers, which were kind of like DC's Suicide Squad at the time. Number 10, Peter Parker. Hey. We didn't say which Spider-Man was doing the embarrassing here. Peter Parker and Miles Morales met for the first time when Peter was teleported to Miles' universe. Now, I don't know why Peter's first decision was to attack Mr. Morales. He's had clones of himself before and he's also been to other alternate universes, but hey, that's what he did. And it was 110% a mistake. As fans of Miles know, he is extremely capable. And he also has a unique Spider-Man power set. He used his Venom Sting to paralyze Peter while jumping over him. He then went invisible and got Peter with a sneak attack kick to the face. It doesn't stop there though. After Peter demasked Miles, he got a nice electric shock that knocked him out cold. For an 11 year old kid, Miles gave the experienced Peter Parker quite the beating. Number 9. Winter Soldier and Falcon. For a young lad, Peter Parker seems to overpower a lot of people. In his introduction to the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Peter just shows us and two of Captain America's best pals that he ain't someone to mess with. During their fight, he overpowered the Super Soldier, even using his metal arms against him. Disables and webs up Falcon, and redirects a huge chunk of metal flung at him by the Winter Soldier, all while quipping in the best ways possible. It was honestly so awesome to see when it first happened. He leaves them laying on the ground exhausted and webbed up. Not only an embarrassment for the two veteran soldiers and heroes, but a really fitting and hilarious introduction for the character to the MCU. Number 8. Luke Cage. A lot of the time, when a new hero is introduced into a comic book world, a fight between the misunderstood hero and another has to take place. That is exactly what happened when Luke Cage came on the scene. Luke Cage, the hero for hire, showed up in the Amazing Spider-Man number 123, hired by J. Jonah Jameson to capture Spider-Man for the death of Norman Osborn. Luke Cage ain't a guy you should underestimate by any means. Super strength and stamina, bulletproof skin, and a healing factor. But it's Spider Man. Luke tackles Spider Man off a roof and gets a few punches in. But Spider Man kicked him off of another roof, teased him about basically being a mercenary, slammed him through a brick wall, got several fists to the face in, used Luke's own weight against him, and 
punched him through a skylight. They come to blows later on in the comic with pretty much the same outcome, causing Luke Cage to quit this one particular job. Go web! Fly! Up a boomer away web! Shazam! Go web go! 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 Go web go! Oh wait, that's not my power. No, no, my power is to make YouTube videos for you guys. Do you know what gives me this power? You, liking and subscribing to the channel. And you are doing an absolutely stunning job. Keep it up. And don't forget to check out our Facebook for more content. Number seven, the Hulk. In terms of raw power, Spider-Man stands absolutely no chance against the Hulk. I think his spider sense may give him some kind of advantage, but there is no way he is lasting long in that fight. Unless he gets a power boost in the form of, oh, I don't know, the power cosmic. Oh, that's exactly what happened in the Amazing Spider-Man issue number 328. The Grey Hulk, who yes, is a bit weaker and logical compared to his savage counterpart, is hired by Sebastian Shaw to target Spider-Man. Money is always a good motivator. Unfortunately for Hulk, Spider-Man has been going to the Cosmic Gym and hitting the Cosmic Weights. He lands some pretty heavy blows on the Grey Goliath and even blinds him with a new eye beam power. When some kids are put in danger though, Spider-Man ends the conflict quick by punching the Hulk into orbit and then saving him before he suffocates, standing all confident with his hands on his hips and like that. Number six. The Fantastic Four. In the very first issue of his self-titled magazine, Spider-Man is putting other heroes to shame. Spider-Man infiltrates the Baxter building, where he is encased in a plexiglass cage that he very, very easily opens the door to. He takes a single punch from the thing before he throws him into Johnny Storm. When Reed tries to catch Peter, he totally just dodges it and webs up Mr. Fantastic's hands. He uses his spider sense to detect Sue Storm while she's invisible and spins her around really, really fast with her lasso. But then Johnny Storm gets him in a circle of flame. He says, and I quote, well, I'll just jump over that clown's little trap. It's honestly a pretty impressive display, and it happened in no less than one and a half pages. The fight ends when Spider-Man lets him know that he's here to join up, and with that little fight was just a display of what he can do. Yeah, that little display would probably do better than a resume. Number five. Iron Man. In the Civil War storyline, we know that Spider-Man initially is on the side of Tony Stark's Iron Man. But after he sees the lengths that Tony is willing to go to, he has a bit of a change of heart. Obviously, this leads to a scuffle between the two. At this time, Tony had given Peter the Iron Spider suit. What he didn't tell Peter is that he built in an emergency override that would shut down the suit and essentially shut down Peter with the simple phrase Omega Omega Epsilon 9. It's only a bit of a jerk move. You took Peter under your wing, but you're going to plant a failsafe against him? It kind of makes you look like you know you're guilty. But then again, he is a genius, he is a member of the Illuminati, and he is not the kind of guy to take risks. But how is this embarrassing for Tony? Well, I'm glad you asked, my little nerds. Peter is no idiot, and behind Stark's back, he hacked into the suit and built in his own override to override the override that Tony put there. Passcode, surprise. And the suit is back up and running and covers Tony's helmet in a thick layer of web, allowing Peter to get in a good punch and escape. Number four. Wolverine. This one's a pretty quick one. I bet some of you thought I was going to pull from the Wolverine vs. Spider-Man comic. I'll do you one better. It should be obvious, but you don't dare insult Mary Jane Watson to Peter's face. In Amazing Spider-Man issue 522, Peter is awoken with a call about a newspaper article claiming Mary Jane has a little entanglement with Tony Stark. It's obviously not true and actually a setup by a villain. But that's not the point right now. Peter got out of his bed in Stark Tower and goes looking for his wife. Along the way, he runs into Wolverine and a room with a very lovely high up view of the city. Now, Logan decides to start going on about how Mary Jane messed up big time and after a warning from Peter, he decides to comment on her lack of brains. This lovely little comment gets him thrown through an unbreakable glass window and it gives him a really colorful way to catch a cab. Number three. Daredevil. When Spider-Man was in possession of the symbiote suit, he wasn't his normal self. He was much, much more ruthless. And Spider-Man can already knock criminals into a coma when he is pulling his punches. When Spider-Man interrupts Sin Eater Stanley Carter from attacking Betty Brant and almost killing her, 
he starts to lay into the guy, beating Stanley while giving him an earful. Peter goes so far that Daredevil notices his heartbeat pounding and pulls him off of the beaten villain. He defends the criminal from Peter who is seemingly gonna kill him. If you want him, you'll have to come through me. Probably not the best choice of words there, Daredevil. The very next panel shows Daredevil flying through a window. If it wasn't such a serious moment, I would laugh. Nah, I did laugh. <laughs> Is that wrong? I, uh, I can't help it, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Number two, the X-Men. It seems that Spider-Man really shows his skill when he comes into contact with teams of heroes. First the Fantastic Four, and in the fourth issue of Secret Wars, the X-Men. As if dealing with multiple superpowered beings was his speciality or something. I think the best part about these altercations is the way he just keeps talking while he's embarrassing them. After Xavier senses Spider-Man listening in on their conversation, Spider-Man attacks the X-Men a little prematurely, I'll admit. He dodges Wolverine, webs Colossus's face, dangles Rogue from a rod, webs up Nightcrawler faster than he can say BAMF, and swats Wolverine away with a single swing and escapes. It's just so crazy to me how he knows that he easily outclasses almost every one of the X-Men. Or if not, he knows exactly how to subdue them. Number one. Superboy. If we're doing a video about characters embarrassing other heroes, there is almost always going to be one point that has to do with the DC and Marvel crossover event. Just like the first point, this isn't actually Peter Parker though, but it's a clone of him, so that's basically the same thing. When the DC Marvel crossover happened, Ben Riley had taken up the Spider Man mantle. And it was him that fought Superboy on a rooftop. To get things going, Spider Man hits the Superboy with a webbing right to his very stylish sunglasses. Superboy, just trying to get a hit on our Spider Friend, busts a hole into a water tower, drenching the entire battlefield. Spider Man wouldn't stand too long in a one on one slugging match with this guy, but that's not his specialty, anyways. Just as Superboy is about to land a flying blow into Spidey, he jumps out of the way, firing webbing all over the guy and leaving the soaking wet Superboy to fly straight into an electrical box, taking him right out of the fight. Kicking off the list at number 10, Diana gets ahead of the game. One of the changes to reality that occurs during the Flashpoint event is when Wonder Woman and Aquaman get married. I mean, it's great. I mean, well, not really. I mean, weddings are fun, I guess. I don't know. I, I hear shout and then I black out. It's so weird how that works. So this is the reality now where Bruce Wayne was shot and not his parents. And if that wasn't wild enough, Superman is now in a government lab having a not so relaxing time and then we see Diana being saved by a sea monster from Aquaman. How lovely. A nice thing. This is great. We have nice things in this list already. Lovely. Ah yes. Classic Wonder Woman. Nice. Nothing like getting cheated on and then having your head cut off. Adding injury to insult this time. And then she pops her crown off of her severed head and then places it nicely on her own head. A war of course follows between the Atlanteans and the Amazons but it comes to a lovely conclusion when Wonder Woman stabs Aquaman in the back. And yes, I mean literally in a sense. And before we go on to number nine, guys, if you want to go ahead and give this video a like, that would be great. You're the best. Thank you so much for watching. Let's pop right back into number nine right off the bat. Let's keep going. Number nine, hard feelings. This next one isn't exactly a bad deed, but it's too weird of a Justice League story to not include. So I'm going to throw it in at number nine. One I'd rather not have in my brain all day. So let's just get it out of the way. So now we go to World's Finest Comics issue 289. So Batman and Superman decide to catch up on some bro time, you know, take a break from beating up bad guys, just have a heart to heart. See what's going on in here. Now this heart to heart is the start of a wild adventure. Now the issue is titled The Krill Way of Dying and the dialogue itself is really good stuff actually. It highlights the mental health struggles that superheroes go through, you know, not being able to save everybody. It's meaningful, it's powerful dialogue. But what takes this issue to new heights, well rather new lows, is when Superman and Batman are interrupted by a meteorite crashing and out of the meteorite emerges the crew. Now the crew, not what you imagine in your head off the bat. I can tell you that because the crew, uh, they're a bunch of space worms and they're attracted to sadness. That's how they found the two because they were talking about super sad stuff and they're like, Yes, sad. This way. Let's go. Let's head it. Their super depression was literally glowing. So these aliens need emotion in order to pass away. See what happens when you try and feel nice things, Justice League? Way to go. Now we're all crying. I'm definitely crying. They're crying. They're dead. Space worms are coming for me because I'm crying now. What a vicious circle. Number eight, Lockdown Beatdown. Kingdom Come is a four issue mini series that comes from Mark Wade and Alex Ross. It's an Elseworlds imprint. Now in this alternate reality, 20 years into the future, our heroes have gotten a little older, so they settled into their retirement life. Now these new anti-heroes stepped up and new vigilantes of course soon followed. Some of them were children of the previous superheroes, so it goes kind of deep. See Parasite breaks open a hero named Captain Adam 
and you already know by his name how that's gonna turn out if something like that were to explode. Boom, there goes Kansas, gone. No, literally Kansas was gone. It was now just this wasteland. So this is when the Justice League comes in to save the day, or I guess turn the wasteland into a super prison too, that, that as well. So when you throw super villains and superheroes into this alien tech super prison, there's gonna be a few fist fights, that's for sure. Number seven, the Crime Society. Hailing from Earth 3 comes the Crime Society of America, but not to be confused with the Crime Syndicate of America, who we may or may talk about later on. Consisting of Johnny Quick the second, Owlman the second, Power Ring, Superwoman, Ultraman, and a few others, this team of villains is basically just evil doppelgangers of the Justice League and the Justice Society. The Crime Society encountered and fought the challengers consisting of Donna Troy, Jason Todd, Kyle Rayner, and Bob the Monitor, and the Jokester. After the challengers and the Jokester escaped to another universe, the Crime Society were offered a place among Monarch's transdimensional army, which they accepted, of course. The Crime Society went on to fight on Earth-51 and battle the Monitors. When Superboy Prime subsequently caused the destruction of Earth-51's reality, it's unknown if any of the Crime Society were able to actually survive that. Now while we're waiting to hear their fate, why not check out their story for yourself, starting with 2007's 52, number 52. Number 6, Batman ignores Blue Beetle. So back in Countdown to Infinite Crisis, Blue Beetle had actually approached his super friends and teammates after he had discovered something called the OMAC Project. So he brought it to Batman's attention, but Bruce just doesn't really give a damn at this point. He brushes him off almost immediately. Well, the OMAC project, of course, turned out to be something, and when Blue Beetle discovered it, he's all by himself, and he doesn't live to tell the tale. If only Batman just took him seriously in this moment, things would have turned out a lot less ugly for him. I mean, I know Batman created this thing in the first place, so it's kind of fair that he didn't listen to him, but like before Infinite Crisis, the OMAX killed a lot of people. Shouldn't have just given him like two minutes to maybe explain. And the fact that Batman didn't just listen to his team member, especially when he already knew something was kind of going on, Sounds like it's all on you, Batman. I don't want to be the guy to say it, but I was just the guy to say it. Halfway through in an over five, Wonder Woman destroying the Justice League. When it comes to power and skill levels, Wonder Woman is arguably one of the strongest members of the Justice League. Characters like Superman and Martian Manhunter may have incredible power as aliens, and Superman, especially, may well just be the most powerful hero of all. But Wonder Woman is also basically a deity, at least being a god adjacent, because, you know, she's an Amazon. She's one of DC's most powerful heroes, if not their most powerful hero, <laughs> especially if Kryptonite's around. And she has to keep her abilities and powers in check, much like how Spider-Man always has to pull his punches so he doesn't kill someone. However, in a one shot called JLA A League of One, written by Christopher Moeller, Wonder Woman realizes that the Justice League are just holding her back. She realizes that the entire League will be destroyed if she doesn't stop them herself, so she takes on each member of the Justice League and takes them down on her own so that she can act individually, kind of like a mini version of Marvel's Civil War but on a much smaller and less daunting scale. Though understandable, this is still an initial betrayal and a major hurt. Luckily for Wonder Woman, her team does forgive her because, you know, she didn't actually kill them. Maybe she was just having a midlife crisis. We don't know. Number four, get a room. Look guys, superheroes have emotions just like us, okay? They meet other superheroes and they take down bad guys together. They hook up in the sky in the owl ship above the rest of the world. They're just like us, okay? Sometimes key intimate moments are hard to conceal when you have the powers of a god, right? Specifically Wonder Woman and Superman. So after the triumph that is the Dark Knight Returns, Frank Miller decided to dive into an intimate moment with those two. So Wonder Woman and Superman embrace in each other, but where does this happen? In a fancy hotel? Fortress of Solitude? No and no. They get it on up there, in the sky, of course, where everyone can see and hear. So they're superheroes, so this caused massive tidal waves. Volcanoes are blasting off, people are even evacuating islands. Like, this is a bad day. I mean, bad day for everybody but Superman and Wonder Woman. They look like they had a great time. Number three, Injustice Justice League. Now, I think everyone can agree that no other timeline has featured more DC character deaths than the Injustice timeline. After the Joker takes virtually everything from Superman, the Man of Steel finally cracks and just kills the Clown Prince of Crime. From there, heroes continue to devolve into their worst selves with a fair split maintaining their moral codes and principles. In the video game and comic franchise Injustice Gods Among Us, the Justice League still calls themselves by that same name, eventually changing it to the regime though. But that's about the only similarity between the two universes because the Injustice universe is about as dark as it can get. Superman loses his cool and just thrusts his hand through the clown's chest after the Joker destroys Metropolis, killing Lois Lane. As you might imagine, this not only kills the Joker but surprises Batman and everyone else around him. 
Superman decides he is fed up with the old way of doing things and sets out to create a new world order under his totalitarian rule. Superman reforms the League after opposing Batman and many of his other former friends. In the end, it's actually the Dark Knight who succeeds in recruiting Superman from the regular DC Universe, who comes in to defeat his darker alter self. Now, if you're not familiar with this storyline, check it out for yourself starting with 2013's Injustice Gods Among Us number one, or honestly, just head back and play through the games one more time. Number two, Superman outs Batman. So in the climax of Batman vs Superman, we see Bruce Wayne straight up try and take out the Man of Steel. It's intense, and it ends with Superman not surviving in a way, but until he comes back in the Justice League movie. Spoilers. So if you're feeling a little upset about that, this next one should turn the tables in your mind. Superman once outed Batman, and he did it in a pretty hilarious way. Through social media, of course, of course. Did he make a TikTok? No. Was it through Ask FM? No and no. It was in the pages of Injustice Gods Among Us issue 10. I mentioned this comic earlier because it has our super friends going against each other, but Superman takes it up to the next level when he posts Batman's true identity online. His tweet was quite simple and to the point. Batman is Bruce Wayne. 1.5 million retweets, not too shabby at all. Batman's trending on Twitter in real life almost like once a week. So I'm just waiting for the day when I look and I'm like, yes, Batman is real. And he's Paul Giamatti, get out of here, I knew it knew it. Number one, Justice Lords. The DCAU introduced us to the Justice Lords back in November 2003 in an episode titled A Better World. Was it a better world? No, definitely not. They were a multiversal counterpart of the Justice League. This is an alternate universe now, one where Lex Luthor is the current president of the United States. The Justice Lords were assembled to protect humanity from itself, which just sounds like bad news. That sounds like a bad story in the making. So yeah, they were robot replicas of Superman, and the inmates of Arkham Asylum were brainwashed and lobotomized. Automized. Just not an ideal world at all. Definitely not a better one. And then when the Justice Lords of this universe found out they weren't alone, they tried to bring their ways of heroics over to our world. But our good Justice League took them down with the help of our Lex Luthor, who used the power disruptor to neutralize their super abilities. So it's like good Lex, bad Lex, good team, bad team, mind explosion. The idea of a rogue team member is terrifying, but a rogue team? Oh, what a nightmare. How do you stop them? An intent exposed Batman. While this seems like something any version of Superman would do if they turned bad, it's actually interesting to see that only the Injustice version of Superman actually did it. Yes, after getting fed up of Batman leading the resistance against his totalitarian regime, because you know, that's a bad thing Bruce, Superman tells the whole world that Batman is really Bruce Wayne. How does he do this you may ask? Uh, like a press conference, or like a, a world, world message, or like a video? No. None of the above. The dude just frickin' tweets. <laughs> Superman, in just four simple words, tells the world that Batman is Bruce Wayne. Using those four words, actually, in that order. From the official Superman Twitter account, by the way. Dude doesn't even use his Clark Kent Twitter. I, like, he's still hiding behind his identity, but he decides to out Bruce's. That's, that's hypocrisy right there. But I guess that's all politicians. With over 2.5 million retweets and over 3.5 million favorites, this is certainly number one on trending for sure. At least until Kim K posts a pic in like a sexy Batman costume so that the whole Bruce is actually Batman thing moves to number two and then the whole internet breaks again. In at nine, joining Reverse Flash. In Tales from the Dark Multiverse 1, Flashpoint, we see a world where Barry Allen died while attempting to get his speed back with Thomas Wayne in the Flashpoint timeline. This leads to Reverse Flash claiming to be the Flash and trying to end the war with the Atlanteans and Amazons by threatening them. <laughs> Obviously, this doesn't work out because they're the goddamn Atlanteans and Amazons. So, in an effort to save himself, Reverse Flash races through time, changing events to create the world exactly how he wants it, which involves saving not only Bruce Wayne, but Martha and Thomas Wayne as well, resulting in a world without a Batman. Because, you know, Batman's gonna fight against Reverse Flash no matter what. So, just getting rid of Batman. This is the smartest thing any villain has ever done, straight up. But on the final page of this issue, we see Eobard with all the new heroes he ended up creating and convincing them to join him, as we can see by the reverse flash symbols on their suits. Even Green Lanterns and Wonder Woman has one. This page also has a Superman and honestly, sick suit, but being controlled or I guess led by the reverse flash makes this utterly horrifying to think about, especially when you can see the other members of the Flash family racing behind reverse flash. Like he finally got what he wanted. 
Eobard became the Flash, and now he has his own Justice League that serves his own purposes. That should, this should have been higher. <laughs> in a day, put Atlantis in the desert. Superman has his dark moments in Injustice. It, this especially includes Injustice Gods Among Us number 12. Written by Tom Taylor with art from Mike Miller and Tom Denerick. Injustice Gods Among Us 12 shows readers Aquaman unleashing Atlantean armies on coastal cities around the globe as a way to show Superman that, you know, this it's not going to happen. Atlantis will not be taken. Superman, of course, takes this as a threat because he of course he does, and you know, Batman knew this would happen. But Aquaman, being Aquaman, refuses to back down, and Superman decides to teach him a lesson. But rather than actually like attacking and probably killing Aquaman, Superman enlists the help of Wonder Woman and the Green Lantern to literally lift Atlantis from the ocean and set it down in the middle of the Sahara Desert. As far from water as he could possibly get on Earth. Honestly, he might as well just put them in space, although that would just be like direct murder and everyone would have gotten mad at that. But like honestly, I don't think Superman is above that. This guy is a freaking monster. Number seven, Tower of Babel. JLA Tower of Babel is a Justice League storyline and one of the best storylines in my humble opinion. Written by Mark Wade and illustrations by Howard Porter, Batman is the greatest detective alive. Odds are, if you're ever in a room with Batman, he's already thought out your every move and he's planned his accordingly. He's always two steps ahead. That's what makes him the best. He also just happens to be the sole reason that everything goes in this storyline. He doesn't mean to, but it happens. So Ra's al Ghul and the League of Assassins launched this huge simultaneous attack on every member of the Justice League of America. Now the attacks are so specific, they're aware of the weakness of each League member. Now Batman was once worried that one or all of them could go rogue at any point, so he had contingency plans in order to take them out if that day ever came. So Talia al Ghul broke into the Batcave and stole those files. So if you want to take down some bad guys, here's exactly how to do it. Thanks, Batman. The best files ever. Now we have all the deepest, darkest secrets. Cool. So Plastic Man gets frozen and then shattered. A specifically designed Vibra bullet hits the Flash in the neck and causes him to have seizures at light speed, which sounds like an absolute nightmare. And Superman gets exposed to red kryptonite. And sadly, many more get hit too. And it's six, Batman's backup plan. At this point, it's pretty well known that Bruce Wayne kept files and tools to destroy each of the members of the Justice League if it was necessary. Though Clark, like I said, wants Batman to have this ability since he fears himself if he ends up getting manipulated or whatnot like literally every time Brainiac shows up. But the other Justice League members have not given Batman their information or like been like, yeah man, you can do that. In JLA The Tower of Babel by Mark Wade and Howard Porter, Batman is shown to keep secret records of how to completely destroy each and every member of the Justice League. These records are then taken by Ra's al Ghul and used to decimate the League, proving an ultimate betrayal on the part of Bruce Wayne. Okay, I get it, like I understand the desire to be prepared since, you know, people in this universe seem to be turned by villains like Brainiac on a regular basis. But that's that's what Task Force X is for. That's why we have a whole game called Kill the Justice League. You don't need to have like a super secret, this is how you kill all of us hard drive that just begs for every single villain to try and steal it. Like it's kind of stupid how you thought that was a good idea. All you need to do is have it in your brain. You're the world's greatest detective and you couldn't detect that that was a bad idea. Number five, the Justice Lords. What makes the Justice Lords darker than the other timelines mentioned so far is the fact that the Justice League actually managed to completely rid their world of crime. While an absence of crime would be a positive thing for most, it's actually alluded that this version of the Justice League went to pretty extreme measures in order to accomplish such a feat. Appearing in the Justice League animated series episode A Better World, Lex Luthor has become the President of the United States and decided to just execute the Flash. That didn't really sit well with the Flash's friends, which is why an enraged Superman confronted Luthor in the Oval Office. Realizing he would never reform Luthor and keep him from committing such villainous acts, he incinerated him on the spot with his heat vision. With the President out of the way and a new method devised to deal with villains, the Justice League rechristened themselves the Justice Lords and went about establishing a new world order under their quote unquote protection. They eventually came into conflict with the Justice League when they tried to instill their totalitarian rule on the other DC universes, but thankfully they were finally stopped by Superman and his pals, which actually included Lex Luthor who became instrumental in stopping the Justice Lords and stripping them of their power. Check out this episode for yourself in 2003's Justice League Season 2, Episode 22 and 23 as well. In it for Aquaman and Wonder Woman War. 
Ha, <laughs> it rhymes. Ah, look at that. I managed to squeeze two flashpoint numbers onto this list. Hell yeah. I mean, they're different flashpoints, but still. In the animated, the flashpoint paradox movie in the DC animated universe, the world is much different to its CW counterpart. And, like, kind of the the general DC universe. Mostly due to the war between Aquaman and Wonder Woman who end up being the villains of the movie, thanks to them being former lovers while Aquaman was married to Mira, and then Wonder Woman then killed Mira when she tried to get revenge for her sleeping with her husband. But to be fair, um, she also wears Mira's crown after she kills her, so it's not really like it was like, oh yeah, it was self-defense. However, this war actually resulted in the destruction of the planet at the exact moment that Barry was able to get enough speed back to get back into the speed force and set everything straight. It's a really suspenseful moment where Reverse Flash had just been killed by Batman, so Barry would have enough speed to run back and stop him himself from saving his mother, he managed to get into the speed force just before the world's destruction caught up with him. It's absolutely insane. It's very um, Justice League Zack Snyder Cut-esque. However, I'm pretty sure they got it from this movie either way. He managed to get back into the speed force before the world's destruction and then the world was destroyed. But so yeah, it's a bad thing, okay? Even if the Justice League isn't really a thing in this universe, it was still their fault. Number three, Superman moves Atlantis. Injustice Gods Among Us issue 12 is the final issue of the first Injustice comic series written by Tom Taylor. And we see Aquaman just unleash the ultimate pain. He's not having an easy go at this time. He's unleashing armies on coastal cities. He's trying to show Superman that he has the power as well, and that he's not gonna allow Atlantis to be taken over. So Superman is like, okay, you think you're the tough dude? No problem. Let me step in. Superman sees this as a threat, and even Batman's like, great, this is exactly what I thought was gonna happen between these two. So Superman doesn't just fly in, fight Aquaman one-on-one, -on -one, and then settle their differences with this whole ordeal. No, instead, Arthur gets the help of Wonder Woman and Green Lantern, and they literally move Atlantis. They move Atlantis like it's new furniture. Pivot! Pivot! They move it to the Sahara Desert, the place with the least amount of water possible. Not cool, guys. Not cool. Penultimately, in a number two, ruled the world. Usually, when people talk about Superman ruling the world, they're talking about injustice. And while that is a great story and an example of what can go wrong with superheroes, the story of the king of the world is actually a good cautionary tale about Superman other than injustice. In the late 90s, this story features a series of prophecy-like dreams that make Superman realize that his regular MO of just flying around and waiting for disasters to happen isn't really working. And Kal-El decides to be a little more um, proactive. In this case, that means building a series of spy satellites to survey Earth, helping Superman keep track of everything that's happening all at once, and then giving up his life as Clark Kent to work as Superman full time. Sleep deprived and losing his grip on humanity, Superman starts interfering more and more in Earth's affairs, toppling extremist governments and even changing the weather. <laughs> When he realizes that he still can't be everywhere at once though, the Man of Steel deploys an army of Superman robots to help maintain law and order. Again, making him a benevolent dictator. Only snapping out of it when he gets a kiss from Lois Lane. None of the Justice League really tries to stop him either. They just kind of accept it, which is surprising, especially for Batman. Although I find it funny how the Man of Steel deployed Men of Steel. And finally, and at number one, getting Alfred killed. Look, after Bruce Wayne loses his parents, Thomas and Martha, he's a young boy, okay? The only person who can truly take care of Bruce is Alfred Pennyworth the Wayne family butler. However, Alfred ends up becoming like a second father to Bruce, raising him to adulthood and caring for him throughout his entire life. He also cares for Bruce's children as a grandfather and sometimes even more of a father than Bruce to them. Alfred is incredibly important to Bruce and probably the only family that the man truly has left. But. In Injustice Year 5, number 23, Alfred is spending his birthday alone at Wayne Manor. Unbeknownst to him, Superman has sent the supervillain Victor Zass to interrogate him, an altercation which will ultimately result in Alfred's death. I know it was the Injustice Earth, okay, and Supes is a horrible person there, but honestly, Think about it. This is the worst thing that Superman and by proxy his Injustice League has ever done. Because Alfred is the purest character in all of DC Comics. 
And in the moment that Alfred died, so did a piece of the DC Universe. It doesn't matter if it was in one of Infinite Earths and it was one of Infinite Alfreds. None of them deserved this. Number 10, the Super Enemies. Starting off our list today with a Dark Justice League with no comic origins comes the Super Enemies. An alternate universe version of the Super Friends devoted to the cause of deceit, injustice, and terror. The team consists of Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Robin, Aquaman, Zan, Jaina, and Gleek. However, they have no morals and are just evil mirrored versions of the Super Friends. In the episode they're featured in, the Super Friends meet these evil duplicates in the Hall of Evil, which is their Hall of Justice. The Super Enemies frequently taunt the authorities who are are powerless to stop them, although the civilian police are actually equipped to just straight up take them down, as they have kryptonite lasers to stop evil Superman. The Superman of the Super Friends universe first met them when he was mysteriously transported into their universe while trying to stop a volcano from erupting, while their Superman was transported into the Super Friends universe. As Superman tried to escape from the super enemies and the military armed with kryptonite weapons, the evil Superman was transported to the real universe to fight the Super Friends. Superman Prime ended up getting an antimatter flask that switched them back, which was good news for everyone. And then later on, Lex Luthor organized his own Legion of Doom to be the real anti-Justice League, and it had a much, much better name. Check out the one-off appearance of this evil team in 1979 Super Friends episode, Universe of Evil. Number 9, Conglomerate. The Justice League doesn't always have to consist of the same roster. I mean, don't get me wrong, I am a huge Batman and Superman fan, but there is also a smaller and less powerful team called Justice League International. And Mark Wade and Rod Wiggum had them face their evil duplicates in 1992. In the previous story, Booster Gold had just left the JLI to found his own corporate sponsored team called the Conglomerate. Now that didn't work out too well, and the owner decided to pull new heroes out of another reality to form a new conglomerate of Deadeye, who's an alternate Green Arrow, Fiero, an alternate Fire, Frostbite, aka Ice, Elastaman, aka Elongated Man, Element Man, aka Metamorpho, Scarab, an alternate Blue Beetle, and Slipstream, an alternate Flash. The conglomerate decided to challenge the JLI to a quote unquote friendly competition that quickly turned violent when they realized the new conglomerate were all from Quard in evil antimatter world. The JLI managed to get them back into their own world, but it was a very, very close call to say the least. Check out the first appearance of the conglomerate in 1991's Justice League Quarterly Number 1, or feel free to skip ahead to 1992's Justice League Quarterly Number 8 for the fight of a lifetime. Number 8, Flashpoint. In an effort to stop his mother's murder, Barry Allen created the Flashpoint timeline, a significantly darker reflection of the main DC universe and one of my favorite DC storylines to date. In this timeline, Thomas Wayne becomes Batman after Bruce is killed instead of him. Wonder Woman is like a tyrannical ruler of the Amazons and is locked in a crazy war with Aquaman because she killed his wife. And Superman is nowhere to be found, which means the Justice League technically doesn't exist. And honestly, what's darker than that? Probably a decent amount because this is only number eight. But anyways, if you're not familiar with this timeline, then I highly recommend you check it out for yourself. It is such a good one. All I'll say is that by the end of the series, several major characters are dead. And then in the expanded universe of the Flashpoint timeline, even more characters are revealed to be dead. It's, it's just nuts. Thankfully, Barry managed to fix things before it was too late, but that wasn't enough to erase the Flashpoint timeline completely. Because of that, the DC universe is still dealing with the events of Flashpoint even to this day. Give it a read for yourself, starting with 2011's Flashpoint Volume 2, number one. And it's seven killing Green Arrow. Being as powerful as he is, it's important that Superman keeps a tight grip on his sanity and his powers because, you know. A huge part of the reason that Clark trusts Bruce with shards of kryptonite is because he knows that he can end up being used as a weapon or just going crazy if Lois dies. <laughs> In this case, he wants Batman to stop him using that kryptonite. However, when Superman goes too far, sometimes nobody's actually there to stop him. In Injustice Gods Among Us number 11, the issue before Superman dropped Atlantis in the Sahara Desert. When the Green Arrow is trying to distract Superman, he fires an arrow at him that bounces off Superman because, you know, it's not a kryptonite arrow, but then it hits his father, Jonathan Kent, in the shoulder. It doesn't kill him. He's fine. He just got shot in the shoulder, but Superman gets so enraged at this that he flies at Green Arrow and immediately starts beating him to death in a furious rage. I mean, like, killing him would be one thing because he's Oliver Queen and he's, like, one of the sexiest men alive, but brutally beating him is something else entirely, especially with his mother yelling at him, begging for him to stop. Like, dude, listen to your mom. She knows best. 
eat your vegetables. Number 6, Kingdom Come Justice League. In 1996, Alex Ross and Mark Waite teamed up to create the miniseries Kingdom Come. This miniseries was set in a near future where the traditional heroes of the past came together to stop the brutal superheroes of the new generation. The new Justice League of elderly but still very strong heroes like Superman and Green Lantern set up a prison to hold rogue heroes and supervillains alike. Unfortunately, the gulag erupted in a riot between metahumans that threatened to destroy the entire world and that caused, let's just say, a little bit more trouble for these geriatric heroes. In an act of desperation, the United Nations launched several nuclear bombs over the gulag site. Batman and Wonder Woman deactivated two of them, but one of them was still primed and falls over the battlefield. Superman attempts to stop the bomb, but Marvel throws him back and stops the bomb himself, detonating it prematurely over the gulag, killing a lot of the League, cavalry, and many of the inmates as well. What makes the storyline so dark is that throughout the story, the Justice League struggle to follow their own morals, even as they impose their own brand of justice on a very unhappy world. Batman in particular sided with Lex Luthor to quote unquote liberate mankind from the Justice League. In the end, Superman saw his failure, but only at the cost of thousands of lives. Check out the entire miniseries for yourself, starting with the 1996's Kingdom Come, number one. Number 5. Wonder Woman Hunts the Huntress The Injustice universe shows us a different side to our team members, sometimes a little darker than we're ready for. So in issue 21 of Injustice Gods Among Us Year 3, we find our main supers in a world that's not so bright. And when it comes to issue 21 of Injustice Year 3, DC shows us yet again how great Wonder Woman is at cracking that lasso of truth. It's just a matter of where she cracked it, that was the problem. Well, she wraps it around the neck of the Huntress, and the crack that we hear is exactly what you think. Bam. So Batgirl calls her out for being a murderer, even though she really didn't mean to do it. Accidents happen, especially in the middle of a battle, you know, it happens. I mean, the tension was high. The Huntress was punching through shields. Wonder Woman just reacted in a violent way. It happens, you're a superhero. I remember one time I, I wrist shot an orange hockey ball through a garage door thing. It's like, you know what? When you're in the middle of it, accidents happen. You get crazy. Number four, the Injustice League. Back in 1988, we got introduced to a new version of the Justice League known as the Injustice League. This ragtag group consisted entirely of criminals who never actually made it big in their various enterprises and determined to make it big, they just banded together and became the rather ineffective Injustice League. Major Disaster, Big Stir, Clue Master, Multi Man, Clock King, and the Mighty Bruce are what made up the roster. They barely managed to pull off any capers and mostly just got their butts kicked. All enough though after 2000 Silver Age the showcase number one came out, it retroactively made 1989's Injustice League the second version of the team. The quote unquote original team was brought together in the Silver Age by the evil intergalactic Agamemno who used Lex Luthor to recruit other villains like Black Manta, Bizarro, and the Joker. This Injustice League was way more effective and even managed to switch minds with the JLA on one occasion. When the Justice League managed to switch back, they erased the memory of the event from the villains' minds completely. Check out these two teams in 1989's Justice League International number 23, or head over to 2000's Silver Age Showcase number 1. Getting close to the end, in at number 3, Injustice. I think the whole Injustice Earth is enough of a sin to earn a spot on this list. Just the entirety of the Injustice world is truly an injustice. In a parallel universe, the Joker tricks Superman into killing his pregnant wife, Lois Lane, and detonating a nuclear weapon that destroys Metropolis, killing millions of people. Mad with grief and rage, and because, you know, Lois Lane died in this universe, Superman goes dark and murders the Joker, quickly losing his moral compass. Five years after this moment, Superman has formed the One Earth Regime to enforce global peace through fear, and rules the Earth as a ruthless dictator with an iron fist. Or I guess a steel fist. Get it? Because he's the man of steel? Anyway, alongside many other heroes and villains, he recruited or forced into joining him and killing any who oppose him. Batman ends up establishing the Insurgency, which is actually supposed to oppose Superman's regime, and then that's why he exposes his identity. But then the ensuing war between the factions just leaves the Justice League disbanded. But either way, this is probably one of the darkest timelines. Number 2, The New Reichman. Ever wonder what would happen if Superman didn't crash land in Kansas and instead he crash landed in, I don't know, Germany? Well, wonder no longer because on Earth 10 that is the reality. On Earth 10, the Germans used Superman, known as Overman in this universe, to win World War II and basically take over the world. As a champion of Germania and the leader of the New Reichmen, Overman is accompanied by Brunhilde, Earth 10's Wonder Woman, Leatherwing, aka Batman, Blitzen, aka The Flash, The Martian, Martian Manhunter, Underwaterman, aka Aquaman, and Overgirl, aka Supergirl, 
who was unfortunately killed in battle. Alongside the German forces, Overman conquered the world in less than 20 years, after which he decided to leave the Earth for a while. Three years later, he returned with a clear head and saw all of the damage he helped cause and became an advocate against all that he once stood for, well, still working alongside them for some reason. Eventually, German scientists used callous cells to create a clone of him known as Overgirl that Overman loved like family. However, she died not too long after her creation, and this hit him hard. Inconsolable and grief-stricken, Overman leaked some precious information to the Freedom Fighters that resulted in the demise of the new Reichman and Metropolis as well. Check out probably one of the saddest Superman stories I have ever heard, starting with 2015's The Multiversity Guidebook, number one. And number one, The Crime Syndicate of America. Consisting of Ultraman, Owlman, Superwoman, Johnny Quick, and the Power Ring, the Crime Syndicate of America is the first alternate version of the Justice League to ever come to life following the events of Crisis on Infinite Earths. That event erased the multiverse but left the Antimatter universe, also known as the Quardian universe within DC's continuity. Within the Antimatter universe, the Crime Syndicate existed as an evil version of our favorite superheroes, only they were far more dastardly than their previous versions. With virtually no one to oppose them, they managed to establish and maintain control over a large portion of their Earth. Eventually, they grew bored of their Earth and the Crime Syndicate began kidnapping people from the 52 multiverse matter-based worlds and were visited by our Justice League to retrieve the people from the Justice League Earth that have been kidnapped. Fast forward past some pretty sweet fights and we see Owlman along with Superwoman and Ultraman banished to a prison sub-dimension while Johnny Quick and the current Power Ring were captured. Highly recommend you check out the storyline for yourself, so check it all out in their first appearance in 2000's JLA Earth Number 2.